So please welcome James Toronto. Well, thank you, Julian. Thank you, Jennifer. I, that was a uh, very nice introduction and uh, probably have a hard time living up to it. She told you I was humble, right? Uh, Jennifer mentioned how uh, much the country has changed in the past year. And since I was at this conference last year, I was thinking about that. And last year, you may recall, at this time, Hillary Clinton was the next president of the United States. She was uh, running a reprise of Lyndon B. Johnson's 1964 campaign in which he uh, portrayed his opponent as a, uh, an extremist madman who was going to start a nuclear war. And Hillary was uh, making the same argument of, about Donald Trump, seemingly with uh, considerable success to judge by the polls at the time. And uh, the only question was, uh, would she do as well as LBJ did or would she do better? And then we woke up on November 9th and it was all a dream. Now, I had been on a political panel, actually moderated by Jillian, at this conference last year, and uh, I had said I thought Trump could win, which leads to the obvious question, how did Toronto get to be so brilliant? <laughs> now, I'm gonna live, live up to my billing here uh, as a very humble man and acknowledge that uh, actually the reason that I got out ahead of everyone else on the Trump question was because of my own incapacity as a writer. What happened was, in the summer of 2015, when Trump first started running for the Republican nomination, I thought that the idea was as appalling and ludicrous as everyone else did. And, you know, I was trying to think of how to write something about it, how to write about it every day, five days a week, and say something distinctive. And I was reading a piece by Kevin Williamson in National Review. Some of you are probably familiar with his work. Uh, he has written uh, over the past couple of years a series of uh, uh, wonderfully stylish and entertaining anti-Trump rants. And I was reading one of his rants, I think it was the one titled, Witless Ape Rides Escalator. And I was thinking, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to write about Trump. And then I very quickly realized, now, this is Williamson's idiom. I can't possibly compete with this. So what do I do? Well, there are a lot of other people writing against Trump. Uh, it was, uh, there were, uh, there were a great, great many people on the right who were critical of Trump, fearful of him, appalled by him, uh, whatever. So there was a glut of anti-Trump commentary. And most of it, to be completely honest, was not very good. And I think the problem was, you know, it was very easy to list Trump's faults, right? He was vulgar, he was uh, ignorant about policy, he didn't care about ideas, he had uh, questionable personal morals, he had questionable business practices, uh, you know, a whole list of things. You list those faults, and they're kind of obvious. So how, how, how far can you get writing about those faults? And so then what people had to do in order to make their stuff interesting was they had to start getting, uh, they had to start sort of indulging kind of crazy fantasies, like Trump is Hitler. I mean, that's mostly a left-wing fantasy, but there were people on the right uh, who uh, likened Trump to Hitler in 20, 2015 and 16. Uh, there were these fantasies like, if only William F. Buckley could come back from the dead and expel Trump from the conservative movement the way he did with the John Birchers. Uh, I wrote a column about that because I thought that was kind of silly. Uh, I went back and actually looked at what Buckley had done, and it turned out that it was a lot more complicated and nuanced than, pe than people made it out to be. There were people who attacked Trump's supporters and called them rubes or idiots. Uh, and that didn't seem like a, uh, like a very good way to go. So I kind of, by default, at first became what later came to be called anti-anti-Trump. That is, the most interesting thing I found to do was picking apart the more ludicrous arguments that people were making against Trump. And I still didn't have any great sympathy for Trump. But I did start getting interested in why people found him appealing. And the first... I guess my first encounter with Trump supporters, uh, and the thing that sort of made me realize that the appeal was broader than I had thought uh, for the first six weeks or so when he was running, was in early August 2015. Uh, you may remember the first Republican debate. Uh, this was the Rosie O'Donnell debate. 
My friend Robin Weaver, who's the president of the Women's National Republican Club on West 51st Street in Manhattan, invited me to deliver commentary about the debate. And I said, okay, I, because I'm such a nice guy. Uh, but I didn't really know what to say. I mean, what, how do you deliver commentary about a debate that hasn't happened yet? So I thought, all right, what I'll do is I will make it into a dialogue. I'll kind of I'll do audience participation. So I, read, I went down, ran, down, ran down a list of the names of the major candidates and asked for a show of hands, how many of, of you support this candidate as your top choice? And I was not expecting a lot of support for Trump. This was not my stereotype of a pro-Trump audience. It was an urban audience, obviously, Women's National Republican Club, so it was, uh, it was largely female. Uh, and uh, I figured probably fairly uh, socially liberal to moderate, uh, given, uh, given that this was Manhattan. Uh, and indeed, this stereotype did hold true. Trump got less than 10% of the vote in Manhattan, uh, which I think is less than any major party has ever gotten. And it was only slightly more than half of what Barry Goldwater got in 1964 in Manhattan. But anyway, as it turned out, a plurality of the people in the room supported Trump. Not a majority, but a plurality, maybe 30%. I think Rubio came in second. So I said, with a tone of bewilderment in my voice, well, those of you who are for Trump, what do you see in him? And a lady at the back of the room raised her hand, and she said, I'm for Trump because I'm for free speech. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I like Trump because he's not politically correct. I thought, well, that's interesting, but I don't know. And I ended up writing a column the next day sort of arguing with her. And I said, well, yeah, he's not politically correct, but on the other hand, he's just kind of a rude jerk. And I later realized that that, is, that distinction is not as robust as I had thought at the time. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll, get to that, uh, I'll get to that later in my talk. Uh, the second uh, conversation I had that sort of uh, informed my early views of Trump was I, I was out with a friend of mine, a woman in her mid-30s, uh, Republican to libertarian leaning, uh, New Yorker, and I asked her who she was for. And she said, well, I don't really find any of these uh, candidates inspiring. So I'm thinking maybe I'll just uh, vote for the guy who'll fight. I said, oh, you mean Trump? She said, yeah. And I thought, huh, this is interesting. I, there's, there's his sort of vulgar belligerence, I realized, was part of his appeal. And I started thinking about Trump in terms of an idea that I had developed in a series of columns in 2013. Uh, an idea called the crisis of authority. And what got me, there were two subjects I was writing about between which I saw a connection and got me thinking more broadly about it. One was my own experience in college 30 years ago, now 30 years ago, then a little less. Uh, and the other was the IRS scandal, which was just breaking at the time. So my college experience was a First Amendment case uh, I wrote a column about it that was, that was over 7,000 words. So if you want the full story, uh, Google, I uh, see you in the funny papers and my name and you can read it. Uh, but I'll try to give you a very abbreviated version of the story here just to tell you how it informed my thinking of this question. I wrote a column for the a opinion piece for the school paper defending freedom of speech and specifically defending the freedom of speech of an editor at another school paper who had been suspended by the student government there for publishing a cartoon that made fun of affirmative action. I got suspended ostensibly for failing to consult with the faculty advisor of the school paper for, uh, before publishing this quote unquote controversial cartoon, which was not controversial at my campus, nobody cared. Uh, but, and I got the ACLU to represent me and I, after about two years, the, we settled the case uh, on terms that were acceptable to me. So I regarded it as, uh, as a victory. I decided many years later to write about it because I got word that my chief antagonist, the faculty advisor, was retiring. And I had wanted for a while to go back and revisit this story and, and tell it, you know, just, for, uh, just to memorialize it. Uh, so I, I wrote up this story. But as I was reviewing the documents for the story and refreshing my memory about uh, what had happened, uh, I realized that there was sort of a central puzzle to the story that I'd never quite figured out. And it was, what had stunned me about this was, the professor who suspended me and the other professors who supported her in this were all journalism professors. 
Uh, these were people who spent their days instilling in us in class uh, these uh, pieties about freedom of speech, uh, which I believed, and I believed they believed. And it was just, I mean, it was one thing for the student government at UCLA, the other school, to do something like this. But the journalism professors, it just completely boggled my mind. And so I was trying to figure out how that happened. And I, I you know, with 25 some years distance, I, I, I tried to look at it from my adversary's point of view. And the, I, the story I came up with, the answer I came up with, speculation, but I think it's pretty sound speculation, was I, I had been, I'd had a reputation for being somewhat socially rough-edged, for not respecting authority. I had gotten into arguments with the uh, student editor of the paper, I was the number three editor at the time, and threatened to quit and then withdrawn my threat. And so I think what happened was, I, uh, the faculty advisor thought that I was challenging her authority. And I realized that people get very, uh, people guard their authority very jealously. And when their authority is threatened, they often lose perspective and do crazy things. And this ties into the, uh, to the IRS scandal because I think something similar was going on there. The thing that struck me about the IRS scandal, the, thing that I, the, the reason I really found it terrifying, uh, and I don't think that this, was a, that this was a commonly expressed view at the time. Uh, you know, the idea was the IRS scandal was not such a big scandal because after all, uh, the president wasn't involved apparently. There was no guidance from the White House. This was just rogue employees. That to me is much more frightening than if the president had given the order. Because if the president gives the order, like when Nixon tried to abuse the IRS, he could be held politically accountable. He can be impeached, he can be voted out of office, he can be discredited. These are civil servants at the IRS. These are people who uh, are given power over our lives, who have no political accountability, uh, there's been no legal accountability, and they seem to have decided to act as the defenders of the party in power and to do so in violation of the constitutional rights of uh, or ordinary citizens. So they targeted ordinary citizens. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have any political accountability. Uh, and this got me to thinking about how, how I, we have this left-wing ideology that sort of really rose during the 60s has become dominant in most of our cultural institutions, academia, the media, uh, the entertainment industry, uh, science, and uh, as we've seen recently, uh, especially with the Google episode, uh, even, uh, even corporate America. And uh, they have, uh, so the, 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 this ideology that maybe a third of the country to half the country sympathizes with, controls or dominates all of these authoritative institutions. And uh, their authority has come under challenge. And I'm going to use some examples from the media because uh, that's the, uh, the most visible of these institutions. Now, when I say an authoritative institution, in terms of the media, I'm thinking of some of you are old enough to remember Walter Cronkite, who would read the news every night on CBS in this uh, uh, stentorian tone and then conclude, and that's the way it is. And you listened to him and you thought he was the voice of truth. Or maybe you didn't, but a lot of people felt that way. Well, the media had authority. And the media's authority rested in large part on the uh, perception that they were or at least aspired to be objective and fair. And then the mainstream media's uh, authority began to come under attack from various quarters. First we had conservative talk radio in the 1980s after uh, the Reagan administration got rid of the Fairness Doctrine. So you had these other voices out there. Then you had Fox News, which uh, billed itself as fair and balanced. I don't know that it actually is, but Fox News plus the mainstream media perhaps averages out to fair and balanced. Then you had these, these blogs in the early 2000s, which were su substantially a conservative uh, effort, at least at the beginning. I think social media is something different, and I won't go into that, but I, so you sort of saw I, 
the challenge to its uh, to, to the mainstream media's authority. I think the, the 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 highest example of this was in the 2004 campaign when Walter Cronkite's successor, Dan Rather, aired a segment that was supposed to be a hit piece on President Bush, based on what were obviously fraudulent documents that were exposed as obviously fraudulent documents by bloggers. Rather lost his job. Uh, the media looked rather ridiculous. Although others in the mainstream media distanced themselves from rather, uh, some of them even uh, reported aggressively on the story. Uh, but in the years after that, you saw various efforts on the part of the mainstream media to regain their authority. But the way they tried to regain their authority was always in, by acting contrary to the ways, to, to the, the ways in which they achieved that authority in the first place. In other words, they became less objective and less fair. So I'll give you some examples. I, probably very few people in this room remember something called accountability journalism. This was the, brain uh, the brainstorm of a guy named Ron Fournier, who was the, I believe, Washington bureau chief of the Associated Press. Associated Press, right? I, stereotypical example of a straight news operation doesn't play any favorites or anything. So he got this idea, we're gonna do this accountability journalism, we're gonna hold leaders accountable. So let me read you an example, and I, this was an example that Fournier uh, proudly gave out, uh, proudly cited as, uh, as the kind of journalism he was trying to do. This is the lead story of an AP dispatch from September 2nd, 2005. Quote, the Iraqi insurgency is in its last throes. The economy is booming. Anybody who leaks a CIA agent's identity will be fired. Add another piece of White House rhetoric that doesn't match the public's view of reality. Help is on the way, Gulf Coast. So what is this? It's just an opinion piece. It's an editorial, except instead of saying our view of reality, that is the editorial board's view of reality of whatever left-wing paper we're talking about, they imagine that they're speaking for the public here. And this was, so this was, this was supposed to be the AP's way of bringing back, bringing back its authority. Uh, I think the last example that I can remember of this accountability journalism was a piece in, uh, I believe it was June 2008, the headline of which was, everything seemingly is spinning out of control. That became one of the tropes in my column. Uh, accountability journalism somehow disappeared after 2008. Gee, I wonder why. Then we have this fact checking. This fact checking stuff drives me crazy. Because what is a fact check? Uh, a fact check is, the journalist puts forward some statement from a politician, or they also do statements from pundits now, and then purports to evaluate whether the statement is true or not. And they give them these cutesy ratings like pants on fire or four Pinocchios, uh, if, if it's a lie. Well, and, and so it sort of has the, the journalists are sort of purporting to act like judges here. They're making these authoritative evaluations. Uh, but usually this isn't something that is just a matter of checking facts. You know, it's not like Barack Obama said there are 57 states. The fact is there are 50 states. Okay, that would be a fact check. But it's more like uh, Donald Trump says the real unemployment rate is much higher than the commonly cited unemployment rate. Uh, well, that's a matter of interpretation. In fact, there are different measures of unemployment and one might, uh, one might argue that, the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the usual unemployment rate, which is now 4.3% or something, uh, underestimates people who have dropped out of the labor force or only working part-time and so forth. It's a reasonable argument. Uh, so I guess it was PolitiFact.org said that that was mostly false. When Bernie Sanders made almost exactly the same I. Uh, uh, statement with slightly different numbers. They said mostly true. Again, it's a matter of opinion. You could say it's mostly true, you could say it's mostly false. It's just a matter of opinion, it's an interpretation. It's not anything to do with fact. I mean, it has to do with fact, but it's not ultimately a question, that, a, a, a easily resolvable question of fact. PolitiFact also, uh, their lie of the year in 2013 was Barack Obama's statement, uh, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Well, in 2009 and 2012, they had said that was half true, which I don't know how a categorical statement like that can be half true, but <laughs> there you are. In 2008, they had said it was true because he was promising to do it. Uh, and so 
that was sufficient to, to say it was true. Well, I mean, a promise is not a factual statement. You could say a promise is either sincere or insincere, uh, or a promise is realistic or not. But anyway, this whole idea of fact-checking, as I said, it's, it's, the format is like a, a judicial opinion. That's what they call them when judges do it, opinions. And this is what they are. They're opinions, but they're dressed up with an extra layer of authoritativeness, and we're supposed to take them more seriously. Uh, so we've seen these various efforts uh, on the part of the media to reassert their authority. Likewise, in higher education, uh, the, uh, I, the uh, constant efforts to uh, shut down speakers and to give justification, their, their endless uh, you know, rationales, microaggressions, whatnot. Uh, a lot of this is just about preserving authority. Until 2008, this left-wing ideology really did not have political authority. If we st start the period in question at 1968, when the baby boomers were coming of age, and uh, I, the, the, the split between, in the left was really starting between sort of old-fashioned liberals and the new left, the professional class, uh, Republicans have controlled the presidency for much of that time. Uh, almost all the time before 1993, except for the four years of Jimmy Carter. Carter was not a particularly, uh, he, he didn't run anyway as a particularly left-wing candidate, nor did Bill Clinton. Republicans held Congress for most of the time after 1994, and the left didn't really dominate the Democratic Party. They were sort of gradually becoming more dominant, but there was still a significant conservative segment, conservative to moderate segment in the Democratic Party uh, as late as uh, the Clinton presidency, and even perhaps the first couple of years of the Obama presidency. But in 2008, you had the left as the dominant force in the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party ho holding all branches of government, or all elected branches of government. Uh, and then they suffered setbacks in 2010, and I think this was what motivated the IRS. You had a, uh, uh, the left thought that it, had established authority in the, over the government, over, over our political institutions, and they saw a threat to this authority, and they became uh, fierce and unscrupulous in defending their authority. And the IRS scandal implicated other authoritative institutions too. The uh, House Committee that was investigating it found a series of emails in which IRS people were sending around uh, columns from the Washington Post talking about how the Tea Party was racist and essentially taking their cues from people in the media, saying that the Tea Party should, uh, should be suppressed. Democracy dies in darkness indeed. Uh, but the left also felt that its, uh, its uh, continued dominance, despite the setbacks, was assured. They had this theory of the coalition of the ascendant, where uh, because uh, these groups that were rising in power, young people, single women, or rising in number, young people, single women, uh, racial minorities, and so forth, uh, were, since they were rising in number and they voted Democratic, the Democrats were bound to, uh, uh, to dominate sooner or later. Uh, and so you start, started hearing things like, well, you know, you, you, what, these white guys who vote Republican, they're all going to be dead soon, and that's a good thing. I mean, you didn't hear this from politicians, but you heard this in, from uh, some respectable commentators and, and on social media and so forth. It really got kind of vicious. So, uh, so why Trump? Well, remember I mentioned my friend said, I want to go with the guy who fights. Trump was unconstrained by the need to seem respectable. This is why I came to doubt the distinction between being politically uh, correct or being politically incorrect and being rude. You sometimes hear people on the left say, political correctness is just a matter of common courtesy. And I think some of them really believe it. And whether they believe it or not, they proceed as if that's the case. And so the rules of etiquette are constantly changing. And Republicans, conservatives, tend to care about being respectable and being polite. And so inevitably, they're going to adjust. And I think Trump appealed to people 
because he just wasn't willing to adjust. He didn't care. I, and the thing that really got me to take Trump seriously, not just as a phenomenon, but as a serious candidate, was I, when he put forward the idea of the Muslim ban. And it's not that I think the Muslim ban was a particularly well thought out idea. I think it was, uh, it was obviously quite half baked. Uh, the administration didn't even go through with it in full when it, uh, uh, when it, uh, when it came into power. But I had an unusual experience with the Muslim ban. I, I learned about it from the Trump campaign rather than from the news. Uh, Trump had come in to see us at the Journal a few weeks earlier. And I was riding a bus in New York and looking at my uh, emails on my phone. And uh, I got the press release about this Muslim ban. And the previous night, President Obama had given a speech on uh, the San Bernardino shooting, which had happened a couple of days earlier. And he'd spent the last quarter of his speech lecturing Americans about Islamophobia uh, and the, you know, the, the evils of Islamophobia. And I read this uh, press release and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. This is kind of, I think this is a politically smart idea. Uh, and, you know, again, not that it's necessarily a good idea as a matter of policy, but it's not unreasonable to be thinking about whether we should use immigration restrictions to keep out potential terrorists. Uh, it's not an unre unreasonable thing to talk about, uh, and perhaps this is a useful opening bid, uh, a, a step toward a reasonable policy. So I get home, I start looking at my Twitter, Twitter feed. Everyone has gone crazy. Everyone is talking about what a, what a horrible and crazy idea this is, and it's not just the left, it's Republicans too. I think uh, Jeb Bush called it unhinged. Uh, I remember Chris Christie and John Kasich uh, denounced it, and I thought, huh, am I wrong about this? And I thought about it for a minute and I thought, no, nah, I'm probably right. <laughs> and I, it occurred to me as I thought it through that this was actually a more brilliant political move than I had seen when I first read the, uh, the uh, press release and thought, you know, this is smart, this is interesting. I, what he managed to do was make all of his opponents sound like Barack Obama, uh, talking about the evils of Islamophobia and how we can't even talk about uh, the connection between immigration from Islamic countries and terrorism. I, and I remembered something that Hillary Clinton had said the previous month at the Council on Foreign Relations. She said, Muslims are peaceful, tolerant people who have nothing whatever to do, whatsoever to do with terrorism. Now, she could have qualified this statement. She could have said many Muslims, most Muslims, some Muslims, to make it a true statement. But she made it as a categorical statement. And as a categorical statement, it's obviously a false statement. Obviously, Muslims have something to do with terrorism. Nobody, none of the fact checkers went after her for that. Uh, I might have been the only one who noticed. I, I think Trump brought it up in one of the debates. But it was, you know, so we have these, People keep calling Trump a liar, but we have these official lies, these politically correct, acceptable lies that, uh, that we're not supposed to challenge. Uh, so I think that's how Trump won the Republican nomination. Uh, people saw him as the only one who was willing to really challenge uh, forthrightly this culture of, uh, of political correctness, of, uh, of left-wing domination. How did he win the general election? Well, it helped that he had a lousy opponent. Uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton, let's face it, has the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, integrity of Bill Clinton and the charisma of Michael Dukakis. It's not a great combination. <laughs> she also, in some ways, really epitomized the, uh, the sort of soft authoritarianism of political correctness. I, uh, you know, she would, uh, you know, and, and I don't know that she necessarily believed all this stuff. I think that she, uh, like her husband, uh, was willing to take whatever positions were helpful for her. But, you know, so she said things like, uh, well, we all have implicit racial bias. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, this culminated with her comment about the basket of deplorables. 
which was really, I think, a much worse comment than people appreciate. And I assume everyone here appreciates that it was a very bad comment, but it, it was really, I think it was the worst comment, the most hateful comment that I've heard from a major politician in my lifetime. And it wasn't so much the deplorables thing. All right, basket of deplorables, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a, a cute, funny line, actually. But what did she say after that? She said, and keep in mind, she's referring here to half of Trump's supporters. So as it turns out, 23% of Americans, roughly one in four Americans. She said, they're irredeemable. Or I'm sorry, she said, first she said they're uh, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. So all, all the uh, litany of politically correct sins. Then she said they're irredeemable, but fortunately they're not America. Now let's think about this. Irredeemable. Hillary Clinton claims to be a Christian. The central idea of Christianity is that everybody is redeemable. So where, how in the world does she say that anybody, much less a quarter of the American population, is irredeemable? And then she says, they're not America. So she's actually, in her mind at least, excommunicating them, them from citizenship. I mean, this is really an appalling statement. And according to one somewhat authoritative account, this is what cost her the election. A woman named Diane Hessen wrote an op-ed piece in November after the election for the Boston Globe. And Diane Hessen had been a uh, tech company executive who took early retirement. And she went to work as a volunteer for Mrs. Clinton's campaign. And her job was interesting. Her job was to contact undecided voters in swing states. And she wasn't trying to win them over. She was just gathering intelligence. She, was, she, wanted, she got 250 of them, of the 300 she initially contacted, to send her periodic updates about what they were thinking about the election and the candidates. And she said the thing that changed the most votes was the basket of deplorables line. Uh, she quoted one guy from uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, who said he had to look up in the dictionary what that meant. And he realized this, you know, this was just terrible what she was saying. And then, and then he went with Trump. Uh, so I, I, in some ways, I think Mrs. Clinton really, without meaning to, simply because she didn't have the, the political skill not to do this in contrast with her predecessor, uh, she really brought to the fore uh, this sort of ugly authoritarian uh, streak on the left and drove people to vote for Trump despite whatever doubts uh, they might quite reasonably have had about him. So if Trump is the country's response to the crisis of authority, uh, how is he doing in resolving it? And I think here we have to say the early uh, indications are not altogether encouraging. Trump himself is not, has not presented himself as president, it seems to me, in a particularly authoritative way. And I think the Charlottesville thing is a good example of that. If you saw when he made his statement on uh, the Saturday of the, of the Charlottesville melee, uh, quite apart from what he said, the way he said it was not confident or authoritative. He came out, he started saying, you know, he started blathering on about how well the economy was doing and how this was a distraction from that. And then he said something like, I, I, you know, I deplore the violence. Then he, he said, on many sides, on many sides. He wasn't quite clear what he meant by that. I, I do think that what he said was more, it was not entirely true, but it was more true than what his critics on the left wanted him to say. His critics on the left wanted him to say there, there aren't two sides, this was all the fault of the neo-Nazis, uh, the other people are all nice people. Well, they're not. I mean, you've got these, uh, uh, you've got these violent uh, people who show up in masks on the left uh, trying to pick fights, uh, and this was, this was basically a fight between uh, I, street gangs of the extreme left and the extreme right with a bunch of, you know, more mainstream left-wing uh, counter-protesters, some of whom were trying to su shut down a, a peaceful assembly, a lawful assembly, but, uh, you know, it was basically a street fight between two sides. Even the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center admitted that on Meet the Press uh, this past weekend. But he didn't convey authority in the way he made the statement. I would have liked to have seen him name the culprits on both sides, and issue a clear uh, denunciation. Uh, 
he still seems sort of defensive and confused about it. And it's more, I mean, th this I think is his central problem. His, 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 he's, it's more about him than it is about I, I, the country and, and his goals. I, and I, I think that's just, a, uh, that's just a limitation of his character. Uh, at the same time, there's very little indication that these authoritative institutions that are in the midst of this crisis, uh, that, are, that are, have caused this crisis, are uh, getting any better, are returning to the, uh, the principles that gave them authority in the first place. And again, I'll go back to the media. Uh, you had, uh, for example, uh, Jim Rutenberg of the New York Times did a piece that ran just a little over a year ago. Uh, he's the media columnist. The, his column ran on the front page, which was unusual. And I took it as a statement of policy because of that, uh, an interpretation that was later confirmed by the executive editor, the top news editor of the New York Times. He said, the threat of a Trump presidency is so great that the media should give up their traditions of, of objectivity and balance in order to take on an oppositional role. Well, okay, except that the traditions of objectivity and balance were what gave them their authority in the first place. Uh, then you've had, uh, you know, the, the, the fact check stuff has got, got, gone to an increasingly silly level. You have newspapers ranging from the New York Times to the, I think it's the Toronto Star, that will do these lists. Here are all the lies that Donald Trump has told in such and such a period. And, you know, some of them are false statements, some of them are matters of interpretation, some of them are trivial things like his crowd size or whatever. But they'll just make all this li these lists of things that, uh, that uh, Trump statements that they disapprove of and have labeled lies. And then they'll say there are, you know, 837 lies that Donald Trump has told. And what does that mean? It's just, it's, it's a fake datum. It's, it's a number, it's a meaningless number that's supposed to sound impressive because it's a number. The guy from the Toronto Star does this, I tweeted at him once, well, what's the comparable number for Barack Obama? And he had no answer because of course they weren't doing this with Barack Obama. But the problem is this is a game that the media can't possibly win because what's happening? Trump is saying, you guys in the media, you're liars. The media is saying, no, Trump, you're a liar. So it's a fight over who's the bigger liar. Well, okay. If you are in a profession where your only job is to tell the truth, that's not really a place you want to be in, defending the, argue, the, the, the claim that you're not as big of a liar as the other guy. And an example of this, uh, probably you, you're familiar with the term fake news, right? And you probably think fake news is a Trump phrase this is how Trump criticizes his enemies in the media. Does anyone here remember how the term fake news got started at the end of last year? It was a term that the media were using, the mainstream media were using, uh, and defenders of Mrs. Clinton. And the idea was, oh, Mrs. Clinton lost because there was all this fake news from, you know, Russian sites and whatnot uh, that about, uh, you know, the pizza parlor in uh, Washington and, and all that sort of nonsense. And Trump just flipped the script. And now it's now fake news is an indictment of the mainstream media. Uh, and I mean, the media uh, just gets sillier and sillier, the media and, and other authoritative institutions. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one, is, one is from uh, yesterday. CNN ran a piece, the headline, White Supremacist by Default, How Ordinary People Made Charlottesville Possible. So if you're an ordinary person and you're white, you're not that different from uh, these neo-Nazis. That's, it's very much like the uh, deplorable line, although maybe, maybe a step further. And then I love this one. The ACLU tweeted the other day, the ACLU National Office, my old law firm. Uh, they tweeted, this is the future that ACLU members want. And they had this nice picture of an adorable small child holding a little American flag. Somebody tweets back, a white kid with a flag, to which the ACLU responds, and I quote, when your Twitter followers keep you in, trek, in check and remind you that white supremacy is everywhere. So a picture of a little, a little child is white supremacy. Uh, so we, I, we also have a ways to go in terms of uh, 
undoing the problem of authority within the federal government. I would just point out that President Trump has yet to replace Obama's uh, IRS commissioner, and career lawyers in the Justice Department, as my colleague Kim Strassel has reported, uh, are still uh, taking Obama defending Obama administration positions in terms of denying tax-exempt status to conservative groups and refusing freedom of information requests to, uh, to find out what's going on. That may improve as, uh, as Trump slowly, uh, too slowly so far, uh, fills the bureaucracy. And in terms of the, uh, of the authoritative institutions, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I would sort of like them to become more responsible. On the other hand, I, it's not necessarily a bad thing that they expose themselves as ridiculous and, uh, and lose their credibility. And so let me close by suggesting uh, a way of thinking about Trump in terms of a rather disgusting metaphor. Uh, and the metaphor is, for decades, the body politic has been consuming poison, this poison of left-wing politics, and particularly identity politics. And Trump is not the antidote to the poison. He's the emetic. He's the thing that, the substance that causes you to flush the poison out of your system. <laughs> and when you use an emetic, it's messy, and it smells bad, <laughs> and it's convulsive, and it leaves you enervated, and it throws off your homeostasis for a while. But maybe it's better than the poison. Thank you. And I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you for the entertainment. However, the 837 or I'm sorry, 838 lies or something that Trump told. Why did the 16 Republicans allow him to be elected? And why are the Republican parties not, you know, what happened to the Republican party in the last election? Well, the Republican Party did pretty well in the last election. I, I mean, one of the predictions we had heard was that uh, the Republicans were just going to get killed in a uh, in, uh, down, down ballot uh, because uh, Trump was going to drag them down. And actually, it turned out, I mean, the most fascinating thing about the electoral map, not, the, not just the presidential map, but take a look at the presidential map and the Senate map. Every single state that had a Senate race last year, the Senate race was won by the, the candidate of the party that carried the state in the presidential race. That has never happened before. Uh, in 1920, there was, uh, it came close. There was one state uh, that was uh, different. I think it was Kentucky voted for uh, a Republican uh, for Senate, but, or no, vo voted for Harding, but elected a Democrat to the Senate, I think. Uh, or the other way around, whatever. But uh, that's never happened before. So actually what happened to the Republican Party was uh, it seemed to accept Trump. Uh, there were some variations. Uh, there were districts like uh, in suburban Pennsylvania or the uh, Tom Price district where uh, Trump did uh, much worse than the local congressman. Uh, there were places where Trump did much better. Uh, but somehow it all evened out. And as to why the Republicans accepted Trump, uh, the main reason is that uh, we have an expectation in the country now that uh, party nominees will be chosen by voters and not by party officials. Uh, that actually started with the Democrats, the McGovern Democrats in 1972, but it's been more firmly embraced by the Republicans because the Democrats have these superdelegates, party leaders that can override the will of the primary voters if they, if they need to do so. That could have happened last year if, if Bernie Sanders had done better. Republicans don't really have that. Uh, very few Republican delegates are free agents. So it's, uh, the Republicans went along with Trump because that was what the Republican voters wanted. Then we have a question over here. And moving forward, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and Liz or I will be sure to get you guys the microphone. 
Mr. Toronto, uh, I'm glad you asked the question of the Toronto Star why they didn't have a similar list of items from Barack Obama. My question is why didn't the Wall Street Journal do that? And, and why doesn't the Wall Street Journal or the Heritage Foundation uh, do that every day, do those kinds of comparisons? Well, I, I can only speak for the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. I can't even speak for the editorial page. I, my, my boss speaks for the page. Uh, I, but I can't say really anything about what the news side of the journal does. My point on the comparison is not that people should have been doing this with Barack Obama. It's that this is a stupid exercise, regardless of who you're doing it with. Uh, it's, uh, there was another, uh, what was the, uh, there was another poll recently. Well, I've forgotten the specifics of that one. I'll give you, an, but I'll give you another example from the Obama years. So in the Obama years, you would often see these polls where they would ask people questions about Obama. They would, they would pose uh, derogatory statements about Obama and say, do you agree with this statement or not? Do you think Obama is a socialist? Do you think Obama was not born in the United States? Do you think Obama is the Antichrist? There was actually a poll that asked, do you think Obama is the Antichrist? And then they would find, as you would expect, that Republicans were more likely to agree with derogatory and even crazy statements about a Democratic president than Democrats were. And the conclusion, therefore, was the Republicans were crazy. Of course, they never asked this sort of question about George W. Bush, Donald Trump, and so forth. Uh, if you're going to do something like that, yes, you should do it in a balanced way so that you have some sort of, some field of comparison. But I think a lot of times the, the, the questions are just stupid to begin with and aren't, aren't even worth asking. Um, I have a little different take on this, and with all due respect to you, I think that Donald Trump is playing you and all the rest of the press like a fine-tuned fiddle. I think he is bringing all the limelight to himself. He's encouraging you guys to laugh at him and to make us think he's stupid and not respecting authority, when in fact he's appointed brilliant people to his cabinet and to the Supreme Court, and they're getting the work done while he's bringing all the limelight and the laughter to himself. So I think he's playing you guys like a fiddle. Well, I would agree with you as regards the rest of the press. <laughs> and I would also agree with you. I find his, uh, his cabinet appointees and, uh, and his judicial appointees uh, quite impressive. I'm interviewing Betsy DeVos uh, next week, uh, and uh, I hope you're right about that. Um, Jimmy Sangenberger, I'm very much enjoying your presentation. I'm from Aurora, Colorado. And I, I was struck very much by what uh, Kelsey was just saying in terms of President Trump playing the media and so forth. Um, but I wonder if there's a point in your mind where there's a, a bit of excess. So when he did his rally, he spent about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, but to a point of excess where it may hurt among many of his supporters, I would consider myself a supporter and very much disappointed and frustrated the other night when he did his rally. So I wonder if you think that there's a point where a lot of supporters will start to kind of turn off a little bit from the, the way in which he handles the media or Charlottesville or some of these things. I don't know. A friend of mine uh, a few months ago uh, during one or another of the Jim Comey hearings uh, texted me. And this is a friend of mine who is uh, – I, very Republican, wasn't necessarily pro-Trump to begin with, but was very pro-Trump largely for partisan reasons. And she was worried about this, and she said, what do you think is going to happen as a result of the Comey hearings? And I texted her back and said, I think like everything else, it's not really going to change any minds. And I think that that is largely the case. I mean, you talk about Trump supporters. Trump's favorability rating, I believe, just before the election, was somewhere around where it is now, in the high 30s. And of course, he got 46% of the vote. So a lot of people voted for him who didn't necessarily approve of him or uh, consider themselves his supporters, except you know, by comparison to, uh, to the alternative. And what's the alternative going to be? I mean, who are the Democrats going to put up in 2020? I don't know the answer to that. but. So far, I don't see anyone who uh, seems like an obvious, easy sell to middle America. Uh, so yes, I think he's certainly not to everyone's taste. 
I, he's sometimes not to my taste, I, but I think people have more or less factored that in. I, and I, I suspect that to the part of his calculation, to the extent that this is calculated and not spontaneous, is I've gotten this far acting like this, why, why should I change? Right. Joy Overbeck, Town Hall. Um, I'm wondering a little progno prognostication from you, maybe. Uh, there's a lot of left stream media hysteria right now about how Trump's war with the Republicans in Congress and with Congress generally. What do you think of that hysteria? Do you think it's based on reality, or do you think it's another, you know, left wing meme gone wild? Well, I think it's based on Trump's tweets. I mean, I, you know, when you keep, when a president keeps tweeting and uh, criticizing the majority leader of his own party, uh, I think it's reasonable to view that as something unusual. <laughs> I, <laughs> now, I, you know, I don't think that the Obamacare uh, repeal measure failed because Trump was warring with the Republicans in Congress. I think one factor might be that Trump is just not very good at that sort of arm twisting. Uh, I mean, Lyndon Johnson might have been able to get something like that done. Trump just doesn't have that kind of experience with, with backroom politics. Uh, but also part of it is that there are divisions within the Republican Party in Congress. And particularly in the Senate, the majority is so thin that I uh, uh, it's difficult to get everyone together uh, and, and agree on, on a package. Uh, so I think that there's much more to it than Trump's war with the Republicans in Congress. But he is behaving in ways that are, let us say, unusual for a president towards his party in Congress. Hello. Roger Glaspie, I, uh, you just mentioned James Comey. And I wonder if you could give us the insider's take on the whole Russian investigation. I am not an insider in the whole Russian investigation. I, my own, I, my own intuition is that there is probably not very much there. I, I mean, if you read the Jared Kushner letter to, I, or testimony, affidavit or whatever it was, that he supplied Congress a couple of months ago, describing this meeting with the, uh, with the Russian woman who wanted to uh, uh, lobby against the Magnisti, Mag, Magnist, Magni, <coughs> sorry, I'm Elmer Elmer Fudd up here. Uh, the, this law named after the Russian dissident uh, guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it was hilarious. He reported that the meeting was such a waste of time he texted his assistant, please call me on my cell phone so that I can get out of the meeting. <laughs> you know, you read that and you think there's probably not very much here. If th This is pure speculation. I have no inside basis for this. My guess is that you'll end up with an indictment or two of somebody like Paul Manafort for things that are extraneous to the campaign. But that's just a guess. I, I have no inside knowledge. All right, this is going to be our last question. Well, then it'll be my last answer. <laughs> uh, Sam Sorba, I'm a longtime fan. Thank you so much for appearing here. Um, I loved your metaphor about the emetic. Uh, brilliant. So my question is, I think that the American people have started to wake up. Uh, as you pointed out, the, um, the, the aristocrat, uh, the aristocracy of the mainstream media has lost its credibility and people are starting to understand that they don't have to be force-fed um, fake news, right? And I'm wondering where you see that going. I, I come from an education point of view. I, I advocate for homeschooling and um, the idea behind homeschooling is that you can teach yourself anything. You don't need a teacher. And I think that the American people are starting to wake up and say, wait, we don't need to be, you know, spoon fed our news. It, that's not the way it is to, to paraphrase Walter Cronkite. So where do you, where, where might you see this going? Yeah, I'll give, I'll give you another example of uh, how the, you know, the media utterly failed to uh, 
uh, persuade people of their agenda. And this was after the uh, Gabby Giffords shooting in 2011. Uh, there was this effort in the media led by the New York Times to uh, whip up a moral panic over uh, uncivil rhetoric as if this were somehow related to it. And actually, I meant to mention this in my talk. I think I skipped over it. Uh, the New York Times did this editorial, which I think is one of the most scurrilous things they've ever published, uh, which would be a long list. But <laughs> they said, uh, even though it was clear by the time this editorial was published that this, the killer had no discernible uh, political motive, they said, nonetheless, Republicans and especially their uh, supporters in the media uh, need to take responsibility for the overheated rhetoric. Uh, and I mean, it was astonishing. They, they then ran an op-ed by a former congressman, Ken Jorsky, uh, calling for more civility. This same guy had called for the assassination of the newly elected governor of Florida a couple of months earlier. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. But anyway, there was a poll uh, that was done about after about a week of this stuff, uh, and it found that so only something like 30% of people thought that uncivil rhetoric was a problem. So I, I yeah, I mean, people, the media do not, uh, often do not succeed in, uh, in uh, persuading people of their agenda, and Trump's election is perhaps the best example of that. Where do I see it going? I don't know. I think we're in a sort of uh, revolutionary time in terms of uh, distribution of information. And uh, one of the big concerns right now is that uh, uh, these large tech companies like Google and Facebook and uh, Twitter uh, have uh, inordinate power over uh, the, uh, uh, the flow of information. Uh, I had a piece on our page this week by the head of a company called Cloudflare, which protects internet companies from denial of services attacks. Uh, so it essentially stops hackers from taking down your system. And he made the decision to uh, uh, end his contract with the Daily Stormer, a neo-Nazi website. He said this was the first time he'd ever done this on the basis of, uh, of uh, the content of a website. And he did it in part because the Daily Stormer was going, people at the Daily Stormer were going around saying, see, they do business with us, with us. that means they agree with our ideology. But the gist of his, the, the headline was, was I right to pull the plug on a neo-Nazi website? And uh, he's troubled by the implications of this. And of course, he's not, uh, his company isn't nearly as powerful as Google. Uh, so I think that's the next place this is going to be fought out, is uh, what happens to these, uh, to these large, companies that insist they're not media companies, by the way, because if they were media companies, they would be liable for the content they publish. So they insist that they're, uh, they're common carriers. Uh, uh, so they're more like the phone company in that regard than like a newspaper. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting legal and cultural questions, but I don't know exactly where it goes. I think it's, uh, it's you know, I can only give you the questions there, not the answers. So that's the last question. <laughs>